Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Bob. I'm with Scoot Networks in San Francisco. Uh, thanks, Phil, for inviting us to be on this panel. And uh, yeah, so I, given where I am presenting here, I have to ask you guys a question. Why did the scooter fall over? Why did the scooter? Because it was too, no, no, it was too tired. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, thought, I had a feeling that's how people were feeling here right now. So anyway, okay, so let's talk a little bit about Scoot and uh, our motto, electric mobility for all, and who we are. So we're the first two-wheeled uh, shared transportation ser service founded by a guy named Michael Keating, who's an urban planner. Um, we have, right now, we're over 6 million rides in San Francisco alone. We actually operate in San Francisco, we operate in Barcelona, and also Santiago, Chile. Um, let's see, uh, majority of our workers are, oh, well, I'll get into this in a bit. Um, so we're a multimodal operation. So in San Francisco, we actually operate two different types of scooters, and it's gotten really confusing. So for the last six years, we've been operating electric sit-down Vespa-style scooters. They're actually mopeds, classified as mopeds. We run, uh, we have about a thousand of those vehicles right now, maybe around 700 are on the road at any given time. And then now, since October, we were one of two companies that won uh, a permit from the city of San Francisco to operate the shared stand-up uh, scooters, the little scooters, they're Lime and Bird are here. We uh, uh, scoot in a company called Skipper in San Francisco. Um, so, just to talk a little bit about, about Scoot and what our differences are and, and really kind of applying to this group here, is that there's three things that we really talk about uh, at Scoot. We are asset managers, and I'll talk about that today. We're multimodal and we're city friendly, and those two kind of go together. The idea is that we try to work very closely with cities to figure out what their needs are in terms of alternative transportation and provide the right vehicle. So for example, in Barcelona, we run a sit-down scooter, we run electric bicycles. In Santiago, we're running uh, stand-up scooters and electric bicycles, and here, right now anyway, it's the stand-up and the sit-down scooters, and perhaps electric bicycles coming along in, in July if we're if we're lucky. Um, so, we, um, so we are asset managers. So this is very different. We think of ourselves not as disposable mobility, right? So we're not out there to take a whole bunch of vehicles, lower price vehicles, throw them on the road, see what happens to them, throw a few more out and just maximize rides. We're about putting vehicles out that we we watch, we manage, we take care of, and we get the maximum amount of life out of them, the maximum amount of efficiency out of them. So how do we do that? So we do it in, in a few different ways. And, and actually, uh, this presentation, here's some pictures of some of our vehicles. Um, one of the things that you'll notice in these pictures is that all of our vehicles have locks on them. So these are fully integrated electric locks that uh, when one goes to borrow or one of these scooters to rent one of these scooters, they open their app, uh, the vehicle unlocks, the cable unlocks, they take it out, they plug it in, they ride, and when they're done with their ride, they bring it to a bike rack, they have to lock it back up and then take a photograph of their perfectly parked vehicle before they leave. Um, and the idea here is just really simple. There's a couple. One is, is to hold on to our vehicles because these tend to end up in trees, <laughs> in lakes, uh, in, on paths, in park, everywhere where they shouldn't be. So um, the locks are a great, great way to keep them, some, this place where people are looking for them to use them. Uh, the other thing that they do is uh, they make the experience so much easier for the user. So in a way, it's a hassle that, oh, I got to lock it, unlock it. But one of the things we found in San Francisco for sure is that the number of rules that are around parking these vehicles is so confusing. For example, you can't park within 15 feet of, of a um, crosswalk. You can't park on a sidewalk that's nine feet or narrower. You can't park within 15 feet of a, um, of a fire hydrant or of a bus shelter, and it goes on and on. You can't park uh, against a tree, blah, blah, blah. So what happens now is that we say, go park at a bike rack. 
So that makes it a heck of a lot easier. Now, there are other places they can park them and lock them legally, and if they want to look into it, they can see it, and that's fine, but they know they're safe if they bring it to a bike rack. And what that does, even if they're locked a little inappropriately, let's say they are locked to a bus shelter, they're out of the walkway, and they're upright, and they're not falling down, and somebody else isn't coming along behind the rider and picking it up and throwing it out in the middle of the street or setting it on fire or whatever the heck they like to do with these vehicles. Um, so that's number one. The second thing is that all of our vehicles, uh, the word telematics has come up a few times. Uh, we develop our own in-house telematics for our vehicles, and they are very well, as precise as we can get. So they are telling us everything from, of course, where they are, what their state of charge is, uh, whether they're upright or not. And if they do fall over, are they falling over at a standing position or did they fall over while they're moving? Very important, especially with our motor scooters. If they go down while they're moving, we know we have an issue and we have to get on it right away. Um, we also, we don't, uh, it, with the motor scooters, if they tip over, we, they immediately go out of service. Uh, we don't let people ride them until we inspect them and make sure that they're in, in good shape and then we'll put them back in service. So the telematics are really important for us and we're always upgrading them. Uh, they also tell us where they are, starts and stops, how often, how long are they idle, um, how, long are, how often are they in service. I think I talked about battery charge, a whole lot of information there that we use every day. Uh, the other thing that's important for us is, the, again, in managing these assets is that we find that we need to have and we want to have our own people working on these vehicles. So we don't use a, um, a gig economy workforce with our vehicles. We don't have people that go out at night in their own cars and pick up these vehicles and then charge them at home or anything of that, na that nature. We actually have our own fleet, of, our t own team of fleet mechanics who go out every day, every night, and uh, work on, rebalance, service, inspect, uh, these vehicles at any given time. So um, this is really important to us for many reasons, mainly having to do with, we think that it's really, um, it really helps keep the vehicles more available, uh, more frequently. It also gives us a better sense of safety. So we know that it's our people that are working on the brakes, our people that are working on the cables, that are changing out motors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we have a much greater confidence in our, uh, in our fleet and, and uh, the integrity of our fleet. So what we had to do, though, because there's not a lot of people who know how to work on scooters or sit down scooters, is that we actually created our own in-house training program. So anybody that was interested is interested in working in elect light electric vehicles. They can come to us without any skills at all really as far as technical skills and we will start them from a level where they will go out and swap batteries and we can talk about how we keep our vehicles charged but one way is we have swappable battery vehicles and we swap them out and these guys will go out they'll swap batteries and then we also have garages where people park and they'll clean and fix and replace uh, cords and, uh, and garages anyway what happens is is that as they do that, as they become more familiar with the vehicle, then we have training programs that brings them to another level, which might bring them to maintenance or inspection, another level, which would be light repair, until they get to a level four, where they can take these things apart and put them right back together again. And so we always bring in people as a level one, and then depending on their desire and on their skill set, they immediately, they'll start working up to the different levels. And then we actually have folks who, um, have uh, gotten to level four and then gone to city college and got an electric degree and become electrical engineers for us and have moved out of the fleet department into our corporate HQ and vehicle development and everything else. So it's been super um, successful, for, successful for us to do this and also very necessary because there just isn't a lot out there. So we keep our vehicles charged in a couple of different ways. One of them is that we actually swap batteries. So most of our vehicles have swappable batteries, which means that we throw batteries in a vehicle, we go out and we swap them out in the, out in the field. The other way we swap, uh, the other way we charge our vehicles is by incentivizing our riders to charge for us. So we have a network of, eh, I'm gonna say, I can't remember the number now. I'm gonna say 50 garages throughout San Francisco. These are garages that we've already, most, many of them are MTA garages. We have put in charging. For us, charging is not like charging a vehicle. It's like charging a toaster. 
It's a lot cheaper. <laughs> it's very cool. It's very easy. Um, so we have many, many places where people can charge. So if somebody jumps on a vehicle and they're willing to go park in a garage rather than, say, in front of their house or in front of their work, we'll give them a discount on their ride. If it's a low battery, we'll give them a free ride. If it's, uh, you know, kind of low, maybe it's a buck off of their ride. So 80% of our vehicles right now are charged by our riders. 20% are charged by our, our swappers that are out there. Um, so we're always working on different ideas like that to, to, uh, uh, to really make this whole thing a little bit more efficient. And then efficiency for us is actually just more vehicles. The, what works for us is uh, having the right number of vehicles out there for the people that need them. And then certainly when there's more vehicles out there, it's easier to send techs out and do a lot of work on uh, several different vehicles uh, in, a, in a more efficient amount of time. So... That's just a real quick thing ab about Scoot. I did want to say one thing, one uh, bit, is that uh, a lot of talk about, about electric vehicles and swapping out gas burning for electric vehicles, and I think that's really cool. I think there all should, should be conversation coming from Scoot. You should expect this, but uh, we should think about ways to keep people from not owning vehicles at all. And so if we can share electric vehicles, I think that's an even better uh, solution than, than swapping out a gas burning vehicle for an electric one. Let's, you know, and really, I think we should be incentivizing people not to own vehicles or to own less vehicles and giving them the options to do that. Now, that's what we do, um, but it is, I think, really the pathway to, uh, to more, more sustainable, especially in an urban environment, more sustainable, uh, livable city. All right, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, that was our panel. I'm looking at Richard to see no time for questions. Are we way? Oh, okay. okay. All right, so I'm going to skip all of my questions. We'll go right to the audience. Yeah. Okay. It's probably for you or Brittany. I served on community sustainability committees, and we've noticed uh, resistance from law enforcement. Uh, oh, sure. Mm -hmm. You had that experience, and how have you dealt with it? So the question was um, for law enforcement: Do they like EVs? <laughs> Are they resistant? Um, short answer is: Oh, yeah, uh, for sure. Uh, we're not we're not there yet. Um, Ford just announced their first hybrid law enforcement rated SUV. Um, so we're going to be starting with those. Um, you know, a lot of. Um, a lot of going green in law enforcement means moving from a V8 to a V6. Um, so we're starting, we're starting small, but working our way up. Um, yeah, Fremont obviously has a Model S in their fleet, so they're making strides there. Um, there's a number of, of barriers. Um, range is, is a big one for us. Vehicle availability is a big one for us. Um, I can't really put vehicles that have planned downtime, like charge time, into law enforcement yet. Um, so I would need much faster charging or something like battery swap or something like that so we can turn them around much quickly or uh, very quickly. A, a lot of our law enforcement, they do two 12-hour shifts in a row. So patrol cars are just constantly in use. So, so that's... Um, in terms of like the tree, low hanging fruits done, that's like the little star at the very top of the tree. That's a very hard use case right now for, for EVs. But I mean, hybrids are coming out, which should be a real big, big help with, with idling. Yeah. Um, any other fleets in the room want to chime in on that question too? Just want to throw it out there so it's not just us. Well, I'll just add the comment um, as far as law enforcement, you can dip your toe in the water to battery electric, start on the admin side, like Philip mentioned. Oh, yeah. The Ford mm -hmm. Explorer is going to be a big first step because it's not a decline in performance. That's a big market mm -hmm. aspect, marketing aspect for law enforcement is the performance. They like and, Fords. Correct. correct. They and love Fords. <laughs> it's just a matter of becoming accustomed to it. Yeah. The Tesla Model S works. They got them down in L.A. as well as Fremont. Mm -hmm. which is a little bit out of reach of most municipalities, but yeah. we're getting there. We're getting there. And we do undercover lights in Ford Fusion hybrids too um, for some of our admin and then not, um, you know, a freeway full pursuit vehicle, but something like kind of um, like the attorneys and other people that would need lights and sirens, but not full pursuit rated. We have, we have those in hybrid vehicles too. Any other questions? Okay, well, we're way over time, so I'll cut it off there. But thanks, thanks so much and thanks to the panel.